the genetics of breast cancer now here at the American Association for Cancer Research. Dr. Matthew Ellis, you've been looking at this and it's complex, isn't it? Very complex. In precise terms, what we're looking at is what we call the somatic genomes. So these are the changes that occur in the breast cancer cells as they develop in the breast. We're not talking about the inherited genome. We're talking about all the corruptions in the DNA that occur as the tumor forms. So these are changes that you don't want? Well, yes. Of course, there's changes like this occurring in all our proliferating tissues in the body all the time. But what we're tracking here is the ones that accumulate in the final stage in tumor genesis, which are in the invasive cells. And you and your colleagues have made one of the biggest investigations of the cancer genome yet, and it came out of a clinical study. What was the study, and what, in fact, did you do? Well, there's a lot of uh, cancer genome sequencing going on right now, but we really felt we wanted to focus this technology on a precise clinical question, which is why it's in a trial. The clinical question is, why do some patients, when treated with estrogen-lowering agents for hormone receptor-positive breast cancer, have a good prognosis because they respond? And then importantly, what's the genomics behind the non-responders? Because remember, the majority of women actually die of hormone receptor-positive endocrine therapy-resistant disease. So this is a huge problem. And so we did a clinical trial where we started an estrogen-lowering agent before surgery to shrink tumors to promote better surgical outcomes, but also we got immediate readouts on whether the tumors were responsive or resistant to the uh, estrogen-lowering agent, the aromatase inhibitor. So about half the patients of the 50 had resistant disease as marked by ongoing proliferation in the tumor despite the drug, and half were responsive, that is to say the proliferation had been suppressed by the drug, and therefore that was in a better category of patient. And then what we did was what's called full genome sequencing. So again, for the terminology, many people doing partial genome sequencing, that is perhaps just the protein coding genes. In this experiment, we looked at the full genome, which is what makes it a very big experiment involving about 10 trillion base pairs of sequence because we actually sequenced the patient's germline and their matched tumor about 30 to 40 fold depth, which means you're generating about 100 billion base pairs per experiment. And as anti-estrogen therapy has in fact been responsible for massive improvements in outcomes, then if you can get at those 50% who are not responding to your AIs, then that, that's a, a big potential gain. Absolutely. Uh, critical, right? It's not just a question of predicting who will do poorly to give them today's drugs. It's predicting who will be too poorly and why so you can give them tomorrow's drugs. Mm, Actually, what we found is Probably there's many therapeutic opportunities there we could address with drugs that are already approved. Now, I, I know the situation is complex. There are a lot of genes that you have found are controlling this, but some big ones have emerged. Could you give me the list, please? Well, I'd like to talk about the top three because they interact in interesting ways. So the most frequently mutated gene, and so remember this is an unbiased experiment, well, gain of functions in the catalytic subunit of PI3 kinase, about 50%. So if you like, that's the so, so for, as BRAF is to melanoma, PIK3CA is to hormone receptor positive breast cancer. That's fully half the cases. So then the next most frequent hit was P53. No big surprise there, because that's cur currently mutated, although at a lower frequency than in other tumors, about 20%. And then the third most frequently hit gene was a gene that's called MAP3 kinase 1. Very interesting because that's a kinase that actually is subject to loss of function mutations. The tumor actually goes to the trouble of actually knocking this gene out through frame shift mutations mostly. So that's a little bit of a surprise. Um, the other surprise to me, and at first glance a disappointment, is that those top three genes only really account for half the cases. So half the cases don't have the most frequently recurrently mutant genes. So what that really tells you is that the rest of breast cancer is comprised of recurrent mutations uh, and tumor unique mutations. And so that's what makes it complex. In the future, of course, you may be able to target those smaller uh, uh, mutations present in smaller numbers, but let's have a look at the three big ones. Could they perhaps represent therapeutic targets? 
there's a two things about extracting medical value from sequencing. One, does it, what does it inform you as to the likely clinical behavior of the tumor with today's drugs? And, and then the second is, are they, do they give you therapeutic clues? So the first piece is, we found something rather interesting. I was intrigued by the fact that the MAP3 kinase 1 mutation had not been reported before, which made me think that perhaps it had been missed from other experiments because uh, they, this could have been pro pro associated with better prognosis, the kinds of tumors that are not present in cell lines, that kind of thing. And that's what we, we found. It's a sort of luminal A or better prognosis type of mutation that when present, particularly with PI3 kinase and in the absence of P53, is marking for a very indolent and endocrine responsive form of cancer. And 10% of patients have it. Yes. So you'd say actually the targeted drug for them is the endocrine therapy, works extremely well. Um, and then in terms of therapeutic opportunity, obviously the PI3 kinase hit is a big therapeutic opportunity. And in the tumors without PI3 kinase, catalytic subunit mutations, we found other rarer mutations in the pathway, either in receptor tyrosine kinases upstream or AKT and even further downstream, which probably produce a PI3 kinase pathway activation event. So there's common ways to make the pathway active and then less common, but they all become something that you could sort of drug at perhaps as a class. So there are insights into how to plan your strategy, your therapeutic strategy for patients from these. Also some possible therapeutic targets there. What about all the smaller genes, the, the less frequent genes? Uh, what can you say about those at this stage? Well, one thing we did that I thought was useful uh, is we cross the mutations with what's called the druggable genome. So the druggable genomes are uh, essentially genes that there are already drugs available for. And what we found was um, there are a lot of mutations in genes that are receptors for benzodiazepines, antipsychotics, uh, opiates. Now, it's possible those are all carrier mutations. They're not important. They're not drivers. They just accumulate because, for example, G protein link receptors are very big and they tend to accumulate somatic mutations that are not important. But we did find mutations in receptor tyrosine kinases for which there are existing drugs for. So, for then example, real we found to get started. Yes. Right. So, for example, we found mutations in, 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 in genes that could be targeted with Im imatinib, which is actually a leukemia drug. But maybe there's a subsection of breast cancer patients who could benefit from these. Now, don't go starting treating your breast cancer patients with imatinib because these, the, you know, these mutations in the receptor tyrosine kinases could still be passenger mutations like the ones I mentioned for the G protein. There's more work to be done. Link yet. receptors. Yes. So there's a lot of functional annotation that has to happen. Yes. But I think looking at it, you can see that there's only one way forward, period, on how to do treatment in the future. And that's genome forward. Now you I'm have to have the sequence of each individual patient's tumor to design the individual trials. You can't do it in retrospect. I'm beginning to get the picture. What you're saying is that if you don't have this, it's like doing it with a blindfold on. Well, that's what randomized trials, randomized trials developing sort of alphabet soup type of chemotherapy regimens are exactly that, right? You, you, for, so a modern chemotherapy trial to improve, say, su survival or relapse-free survival by 5%, where, where the background cure rate is 70 to 80 percent requires thousands and thousands of patients because you are treating the tumors blind to their genomic structure. Whereas if you knew the genomic structure up front, you'd do a, something completely different, wouldn't you? You'd tailor a therapy to each particular tumor per the therapeutic hypotheses that shout at you from the genome. You certainly would. Could I get you then to distill for us uh, briefly what doctors should take home from this, what they should take note of in planning their, their therapy and also looking to the future? Well, I, I think obviously we have to extract the medical value from all this sequencing, but I, I think there's a seismic shift in our approach to cancer because now that we can do genome sequencing in an unbiased way, perhaps starting with just the coding region genes, but as we extract medical information from the non-coding regions of the genome, this will be the entry-level diagnostic quite quickly, I would suspect. And so you're going to see a lot of new trials 
where the sequencing is done up front, and that will probably translate into clinical care quite fast, I suspect. So your pathology report in you know, five years' time is going to look very different to what it looks like today. Well, Matthew, thank you very much for joining us. Very interesting work uh, for joining us here on eCancer Television. It was great fun. Thank you.